So if war is taking place in other places and a country is getting stronger by, by strong arming other people and picking up countries left and right, we should stay out of it. Yes. If, okay, it, doesn't, so, if so, it doesn't threaten our country, then but, yes. But, but let's just say Russia, well, let's just stay out of it. Guys. Russia picks up Ukraine. Guys, don't do anything. China picks up Hong Kong. Guys, just don't do anything. You know, China's like, listen, we're big enough. Screw it. Australia seems weak. So why don't we put a 10-year plan to go take over Australia? Look, guys, just don't do anything. It, does that also mean as other... Uh, power empires keep getting stronger and stronger and stronger. We just sit on the sidelines and the, do nothing. The, well, I, it, Offshore balancers like me believe that there are three areas of the world that really matter. Europe, Northeast Asia, and the Persian Gulf. Europe and Northeast Asia matter because that's where the great powers are and their potential threats to the United States. And the Middle East or the Persian Gulf matters because that's where oil is. And oil is a critical resource like none other, okay? So we have to care about the Gulf. Those are the three areas that Americans should be willing to fight and die over. Then the question becomes, how do you fight and die in those areas? When do you fight and die in those areas? My argument is you build military forces to fight in those areas, but you don't go into those areas unless there's one country in the region that threatens to dominate it, to take it over, to become what I would call a regional hegemon. You go to war against Imperial Germany in 1970, 17. You go to war against Nazi Germany in 1941. You stay in Europe after World War II to deal with the Soviet threat. You go to war in the Pacific in December 1941 to deal with Imperial Japan. Those are potential threats to the United States because there's a serious possibility they'll dominate the entire region, which is not in America's interest. Otherwise, you stay offshore. That's offshore balancing. Again, three areas of the world that matter. Three areas of the world that are worth fighting and dying for, and you only fight and die in those regions where there's a potential hegemon that needs to be contained and where you're essential to make containment work. Selective engagement says that there are three areas of the world that matter. John is correct. Those three areas of the world matter. But it's our job to keep the peace in those areas. It's not only our job to deal with a potential hegemon. That's offshore balancing. It's our job to be in the region to keep peace. Let me give you an example. When the Cold War ended, the Soviet Union went away. John said, as an offshore balancer, let's get out of Europe. I'd pull everything out of Europe. I'd pull everything out of Europe. There's no potential hegemon in the region, right? I'd take everything out. The idea that we're spending absurd amounts of money to defend rich Europeans who have wonderful infrastructure, while our infrastructure is going to hell in a handbasket drives me crazy. Let the Europeans defend themselves. If Adolf Hitler comes back from the dead, Germany goes on another rearmament campaign, then I'm willing to come back in. But absent that, I stay out. I let them pay for themselves. I'm an offshore balancer. Most of my realist friends disagree with me. They say, John, we have to stay in Europe to keep the peace. The Europeans are dangerous to themselves and ultimately dangerous to us. Let's stay over there and play the role of Uncle Sugar Daddy. Okay, that's selective engagement. It's selective because they think that three areas of the world matter, like the offshore balancers think. It's just that they favor maintaining peace over dealing with potential hegemons, okay? Global domination. And this is the idea that the United States should dominate the globe. There are no three important areas. All areas are important. You dominate the globe. You're willing to use military force anywhere. I think this view is best captured by Madeleine Albright's famous or infamous, depending on your viewpoint, comments that we are the indispensable nation. We stand taller and we see further. This is Madeleine Albright basically saying we not only have a right, 
but we have a responsibility to run the world. We have the right to stick our nose in everybody else's business. Right. Global domination. Global domination is the grand strategy that we adopted after 1989. And it remains our grand strategy. We believe that we have a responsibility to run the world. It's imperial by design. Now, very importantly, there are two kinds of global dominators. One are the neoconservatives who are aligned in large part with the Republican Party, and two are the liberal imperialists who are aligned with the Democratic Party. And let me tell you what the difference between the two is. The difference is that the neoconservatives hate international institutions and privilege the unilateral use of military force. The liberal imperialists, on the other hand, love international institutions. They're always talking about multilateralism, which is a euphemism for institutions. They love international institutions, and they're not unwilling to use military force, but they're quite skittish. Think about Bill Clinton in the 1990s. Bill Clinton had an administration that was filled with global dominators, as did George W. Bush, his successor. But Bill Clinton had liberal imperialists driving the train. You remember, Bill Clinton refused to use ground forces against Bosnia in 1995, or in Bosnia in 1995, or against Serbia in the war over Kosovo in 1999. Very reluctant to get too involved. Remember what happened in Somalia when those soldiers were killed? We quickly cut and ran. And then the next year, that was 1993, the next year, 1994, we sat out the genocide in Rwanda because we were so spooked. The liberal imperialists were so spooked by what happened in Somalia. Right? And every time we used military force, we tried to do it multilaterally. We wanted allies to get involved. Right? We wanted to work through institutions like the UN and NATO and so forth and so on. But the goal was global domination. After September 11th, the neoconservative strand of global domination moved to the fore. And you all remember the Bush doctrine. You remember the rhetoric after Afghanistan fell and before we went into Iraq, where we believed that we could act unilaterally with our military force to reshape the world in our own image. This is Fukuyama and Krauthammer coming home to roost, right? It's the idea that the United States has this incredibly powerful military, right? And the wind at its back and doesn't need allies because we're not going to do it diplomatically. We're going to do it with the big stick. And we, we have a stick that's so big that we don't need a lot of help. Most of you probably don't remember this, but right before the Iraq War, which started on March 19th, 2003, George Bush dialed up Tony Blair, and he told Tony, if you don't want to go with us, you don't have to go. Because he knew that Tony Blair was the only guy in Britain who wanted to go. Virtually everybody else in Britain thought this was a Looney Tunes operation, including everybody in his government. But Tony wanted to go. Bush didn't want to get him in trouble. Bush called him up, says, you don't have to go if you don't want. And the reason he called him up and said that was because we didn't need him. The American military could do it pretty much by itself. And we took Saddam down very easily. All right? So it's the whole idea that you could do things unilaterally. If you have doubts about military force and you have to use diplomacy, where you think that the military operation is going to get messy, then you need allies. And of course, think about what happened once Iraq or once Afghanistan goes south. Then we start begging everybody to come and help us police the place, because it's a mess, and you need help. But if you believe the big stick is going to you know, produce quick and decisive victories, to put it in Muhammad Ali's terms, you believe it's going to allow you to float like a butterfly and sting like a bee, you do not need lots of allies. And that's the neoconservative worldview. Unilateralism not multilateralism, and the big stick. And that's what you see with Republicans. 
Democrats, both in the 1990s under Bill Clinton and now under Barack Obama, they're interested in global dominance, just like the neocons. But the difference is the liberal Democrats uh, are uh, more skittish about military force. Okay.